Hello, it's Miss Seichter. I will be showing you how I make a clay slab box. In making my slab box, I start by building the simple form and adding detail at the end. Here I've rolled my slab using the methods talked about in class. I work on a canvas board and use two guide sticks on either side of my clay. I flatten that clay a little so that my rolling pin can work the clay easier, and then I use that rolling pin to roll away from me. Every now and then I'll have to pick up and flip the clay so that it continues to grow longer rather than mash itself too much into the canvas board. Since I'm making a cylindrical form for my box, I need a long slab for a long rectangular template. I trace that rectangle using a straight edge and ball up my extra clay so that I can reuse it. This long rectangle is pulled upright and wrapped into a cylindrical shape. Um, it's best to move this clay while it's still wet in its plastic stage, but I need to be careful on how I handle it so that I don't warp or distort that clay. If you have any other type of cube-like box, you'll want to have the clay set up a little bit so that it's almost leather hard before handling it. I bevel the edges of my slab or cut both edges at an angle. This makes it so that both ends of the slab puzzle piece together a little bit nicer. Now I slip and score the two ends together so that it's a complete cylinder. There should be a little bit of overlap in clay when you attach. As you know, in order to properly slip and score, you have to use a tool, such as a needle tool or a serrated rib, to make score marks on both sides of clay, much like Velcro. Then I add slip, or the liquid clay, in the middle that acts kind of like the glue. Water can work for this, but slip is a sure bet. Lastly, you smooth out the seam where both ends of the cylinder attach so that you can't see that seam anymore. You can use your fingers, a metal rib, or a wooden modeling tool to do this. I have a cylinder, but I need a floor and a roof for my box. I pick up the walls of this form and place it on a slab in order to trace the perfect sized floor and roof. I add a thin coil at the seam for a little extra stability and support. This will make the attachment site less likely to break or crack later. This is also slipped and scored until I have a closed form. You never fire a closed form of clay with trapped air on the inside, or this clay will explode in the firing. One of my last steps in this project is to cut the lid into it, which will prevent explosions from happening. Now that my floor and top of my box are slipped and scored, I use a metal rib to smooth out the outside where they attach. Sometimes I use a serrated rib to aggressively move that clay around, and then a smooth rib to clean up all the marks left behind by the serrated rib. You can add extra pieces of clay to the outside for your additive techniques, or carve clay away for it to be more subtractive. I use additive methods to slip and score small rock forms. I'm rolling small balls of clay that I then form into oblong organic rock shapes before attaching. I slip and score each one so that they don't break off. I also use a paintbrush to smooth out any areas I need to smooth out, such as where they attach to the sculpture, just to lessen the chance that they'll break off. I start at the top and make my way down the sides of the walls. I want to give my rocks a realistic rock texture, so I press crumpled tin foil into my clay while it's still wet enough to achieve this effect. With some of the rocks, I use my loop tool to reductively carve away parts so that it has a more jagged look. When my rocks are done, I form a small fish that I plan to use as a knob in opening and closing my box. I roll clay into a teardrop shape, add small thin slabs as a back fin, and use both a small loop tool and a modeling tool to create scales for the body and ribbed lines for the fins. This is very precise work that takes attention to small detail, a steady hand, very small tools, and patience. Just because there is a small part of your sculpture doesn't necessarily mean it takes less time to make. I slip and score this fish in a way that makes it look like it's leaping out of the water, but want to make ripples to capture the motion. I additively attach a thin slab that is shaped like wavy drips. These are formed in a circle around my fish. I then reductively carve away circular ripples that radiate from that splash. I soften those ripples by running a wet paintbrush over these areas to smooth them out. I work very delicately and carefully in order to avoid bumping my fish or the splashes when I do this. When this is done, I make the waterfall. I make a very thin slab 
cut some jagged edges and slits in it, draw lines for water, and slip and score this to some rocks. Normally slabs this thin are prone to breaking, but since this is an added detail on top of other parts of my sculpture, and not just a thin piece sticking up without support, it's stable and it won't break off later. Where this waterfall touches the pond, I add a thin piece of clay that I form by making lots of hole textures for water foam. Between a puzzle lid and a flanged lid, I find that a puzzle lid fits my design best. I use a sharp fettling knife and cut into the enclosed box all the way around until I have a lid. When I cut, I follow the contours of each rock in order to mask or hide where that lid is. The irregular cut in the lid also ensures that there is only one right way of replacing that lid back on the box, and this ensures that the lid won't slide off. With the lid removed, I double check the thickness in my box's walls. There are areas where the walls are as thick or thicker than my thumb, which makes it susceptible to exploding in the kiln. I go in with a loop tool and reductively carve away those thicker areas. This step is necessary for my design, but you should only do this as a backup. In areas like the tall rocks on top of my lid, it's especially important to carve away those areas and remove excess clay. With this done, I double check for any other finishing touches that are needed. I end up adding extra grass along the outside and the top of my sculpture for extra detail. Since these are so small, it's best that I save these little details for last in case I bump it or they get distorted in storage. And here is my finished sculpture. It has examples of coil, slab, and pinch. It has examples of textures with bumps in the rocks, ripples in the water, foam in the waterfall, and scales in the fish. I have intentional use of a puzzle lid. Good luck with your sculptures!